good morning and greetings to all those who have logged in for today's edition of the hindu wellness series presented by the kaveri hospital one often wonders if there is anything called a perfect family because every family has its own unique and joyful ways of interacting with each other staying connected eating their right kind of food and following a healthy lifestyle even exercising to remain fit and building better relationships the last two years have been particularly overwhelming and stressful for all with covid-19 ravaging our lives and routines to help you keep yourself and your family safe happy healthy we have chosen a very simple topic for discussion today it is healthy family happy family on the eve of world health day that is observed on april 7th the topic fills us with all positivity yet there is always a random self analysis which makes us realize how challenging it can be to get started so we share the same feelings as family members to work on a common guide for health and happiness and we are extremely lucky today to have a general physician a pediatrician and a geriatrician on the panel who during the next one hour will take us through the journey of life how we can make it as far as possible pain free stress free disease free anxiety free negativity free and usher in more sunshine into our lives with a smile no matter at what stage and age of our lives we are in there can be no compromise on our health so to talk more about the benefits of a happy life and how to reach that healthy state of body and mind it is my privilege now to introduce our panelists who will then carry forward the discussion let me first introduce and begin with dr kavita sundaravadnam who is a family physician with kaveri hospitals in chennai she holds a diploma in family medicine from uk while her specialty experience of two decades includes effective communication with her patients in knowing their medical history planning their treatment routine checkups and follow up care providing necessary medicals or specialist treatment reference and consultancy support until the recovery of the patient and she also constantly collaborates with patients to improve their overall physical and mental health a very warm welcome to you dr kavita and without wasting much time may i now invite you to introduce today's topic in a brief presentation on healthy family happy family uh good morning to everyone and uh thank you uh, mrs soma basu for this wonderful introduction i also take the opportunity to thank uh, the hindu and our kaveri hospitals for giving us this opportunity to share our knowledge and last but not the least i also thank all the wonderful viewers who have logged in to be a part of this webinar so today's topic being a happy family and a healthy family or vice versa a healthy family is a happy family is actually a very close topic to any family physician because as a family physician as uh, mrs soma already mentioned we give a comprehensive healthcare to almost uh, all ages of life we see from children to elderly and we all see as a family so we the integral part of any family is unless everybody is happy or healthy in a family it is not a complete home so today's uh, topic as she said uh, what is like a how to keep ourselves happy how to keep ourselves healthy especially post pandemic what are we aiming at is what we are going to discuss today she already mentioned that we are all coming from a diversity of culture food habits schooling parenting eating habits and financial status so many things are there molded in a family to make us feel happy and healthy but saying so we all just live once and we all need to be happy and we all need to be healthy this is the motto of any family physician we actually focus on preventive medicine we want disease free community rather than the treating community so today's topic is very apt healthy family is a happy family it's very simple to stay healthy and it's very simple to stay happy but of course nothing comes free isn't it so i'm just going to tell you the science behind being happy so what makes us to feel healthy and more, what is making us to feel happy is not from outside it's not from the environment it's basically within yourself we all have a frame of mind 
is what we make is what we are all made out of if a patient if a person seems to be happy in the morning suddenly he feels low in the evening uh, we get patients complaining of chronic pain all over the body we see patients complaining of anxiety whereas partly their health is in a very fit condition but according to who a person is said to be healthy only when his mental and his physical fitness are both equally good so where, where are we lacking where what is lacking within us that we have to be unhappy why not we be happy we are all blessed to be happy and we are all blessed to be healthy so you know that every doctor is going to tell you do exercise eat healthy food but what is the science behind it unless you know what is the science behind what we advise i think you will not be able to motivate yourself to do anything so today's topic being happy and being healthy starts from within you see everybody is having a substance called as neurotransmitters in our body and we have four of these neurotransmitters which actually is the responsible for us to keep ourselves happy so saying so it is the dopamine serotonin oxytocin and endorphins so these neurotransmitters or hormones have a particular role serotonin increases our uh, level of mood it makes us feel very happy it makes us to feel a lot of pleasure dopamine makes us to plan think and also makes our motor activities very brisk endorphins is a natural pain killer so the body pain or something can just totally get erased if your endorphins are more than enough in your body and finally oxytocin is a love hormone you feel love you feel cared for so saying so you know these four neurotransmitters are so important in the sense if you are not having any of these in the level which is supposed to be there you can get your low mood you can not you can feel more uh, pessimistic in life you can compare yourself you can feel unproductive which finally causes anxiety so but nothing comes free for just to explain to you i'm just telling you if you if you remember decades ago we would have seen our grandparents giving nice oil massage in the scalp oil massage in the body and then having a nice hot bath see all this why what, what is the science behind it whenever there is a massage in any part of the body whenever you do an exercise this triggers every cell to secrete these serotonin dopamine oxytocin and endorphins so automatically you feel more happier you feel more replenished you feel more loved and you 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 feel more productive so this is actually the science be, behind being happy so it is so easy for us to understand that if you do a physical activity if you are doing a physical activity daily your body is going to replenish with these happy hormones which can in fact make you to be more productive and more happy once you are happy you you will feel yourself becoming more calmer and your mindset is more better to be healthy in fact even if you have a health issue you will be able to come over it if you are in a mind of happiness so nothing comes free as i said so in all these hormones the happy hormones can easily be uh, replenished in your body with with a good physical activity so again and again when doctors say do physical activity do regular walking which will make your blood sugar to come down will make your blood pressure to come down the science behind this is because you are going to be replenished with all these happy hormones now what happens when these happy hormones get diminished probably your levels of mood comes down you become more fearful and this causes the stress hormones like cortisol and uh, adrenaline to increase so these stress hormones cortisol and adrenaline have a effect for obesity vasoconstriction in the sense you can get blood pressure this acts on the liver to cause more of glucose in the body and you can get diabetes you can have hair fall you can have acne you can have obesity related issues so it's totally understanding that major signs that is when your happy hormones come down and your stress hormones go up you are a candidate for tomorrow's diabetic hypertension heart disease so preventive measures can be always better than the treatable measures we are we can all uh, do good physical activity have a nutritious diet and definitely be healthy and happy so this is my simple request to all of you to inculcate these few habits in a good parenting way uh, to start physical activity in a earlier way 
So these last two years, as ma'am said, this pandemic has made us to be homebound. We've been forced to stay at home. The sedentary lifestyle has, been, has given a lot of impact so that it has been so challenging for us to do the physical activity. And hence, so the pandemic and its effect, if you see, we have been seeing lately a rise in the incidence of obesity, blood pressure, blood sugars, and, uh, uh, and also depression. So basically the science is because we have been sitting sedentary, we were not able to do any physical activity because we were not supposed to go out. Probably that was the only choice we had at that time. But since now it's very clear that uh, even if you're at home bound anytime, physical activity is not just walking half an hour in the park. Any kind of physical activity can make the hormones to get released and you can have a better lifestyle. And nutritious food, of course. Make sure that you have a balanced diet every day. Avoid uh, sugary beverages and avoid uh, eating out and avoid a lot of fast foods. Of course, enjoying in a particular Sunday or something is okay. But every day, I think we should avoid it and inculcate good healthy eating habits, diet habits in children too. In the uh, post-pandemic, what I like to say is, how do you now know, uh, are you healthy? Have you been in a healthy, regular lifestyle? And since two years have gone with a sedentary lifestyle, I would like to advise you all to take an annual health checkup, which we will be discussing a little later too. So these health checkups will regularly screen all your blood sugars, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, your cardiac fitness, and echo and ultrasound, and uh, certain things like um, breast screening, pap smear, all this is very essential for all women and for men, their prostate glands and things like that can be assessed during a regular health checkup. So, and for senior citizens, uh, Dr. Manikam will be talking on a later basis, rehabilitation and vaccinations, and Dr. Meghanathan will touch upon children's health. So all that I ask today is that if you know the science behind being happy, it will automatically make you feel healthy. And I think we can make a healthy community altogether. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kavita, for the wonderful inputs and re reiterating those very valuable and basic points that we all need to follow. Thank you. Also joining, us, thank you. Uh, also joining us in today's discussion is Dr. Meganathan P. He's the consultant pediatrician with Carberry Hospital in Trichy. Attending to pediatric emergency and critical care and the development of medical mobile application are his fields of interest in 40. Recipient of short-term student award from the Indian Council of Medical Research and the best postgraduate thesis award from Indian Journal of Pediatrics, Dr. Meganathan, who is a gold medalist in MD Pediatrics, has also published peer-reviewed papers in the Indian Journal of Pediatrics. A member of the Indian Medical Association, he is also the founder and chief editor of eMedQ, which is an MBBS University Questions Bank mobile application. A very hearty welcome to you, Dr. Meganathan, and we now look forward to your valuable inputs on how to keep our children happy and healthy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, ma'am. First of all, I thank uh, Hindu newspaper for providing me this wonderful opportunity on the health day. Uh, it is an upcoming topic. Always our uh, hospital and everywhere they will ask me to talk about the health issues, what are the disease spectrum, how to deal, all our, I think this is a generalized topic for the public. Before the, the health issues occur, it's a preventive uh, topic. So I'm much interested in this topic, ma'am. Uh, without wasting time, I'm going to share my presentation. Is it visible, sir? Yeah. Good morning, Anantar. Healthy family is a happy family. Say so everyone know. But how to become a healthy, how to maintain the family in a healthy way, it is the biggest question in this upcoming era. So today, another 10, 15 minutes in the childhood, how to keep uh, children healthy and happy, I'm going to touch upon. As ma'am told, uh, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not a mere absence of any disease. I, I don't have any disease, means it's not healthy. Likewise, in children also, uh, some children have physically fit, they won't have much uh, disease, they weight gain is normal, height is normal, but they can't withhold a simple stress. If, for example, they will go to tomorrow, they are having exam, exam before day, they will get the stress. If, if they are not to handle the stress, uh, he is not healthy, only even though he is physically healthy, not able to cope up a simple exam, uh, stress, he is not healthy. So he should uh, be stable enough to tackle this type of stress also. 
and some kids also there they, they are very physically they are fit mentally also they stable they whatever exam comes home they will be stable but they have the problem of uh, social well being they can't cope up their peer they uh, they have always uh, issue with their peer groups like their uh, like their friends and relatives and they are always uh, like to have isolation they will have easily break out they will get easily angry then their adjustment issues are there so children also like uh, adult they should be also physically fit mentally stable and socially healthy so till is happy then only we call it the healthy infant so as a periods in perspective my to become a healthy the first is breastfeed so it, it may be a old topic it is they keep on saying but still every day there are hundreds of hundreds of babies born uh, so many babies not getting adequate breast milk there in india still now so this again a hot topic everybody should have the breastfeeding is the first gift you are going to give to this right it, it, it have much value you can't compare this gift with anyone whatever money you have whatever uh, whatever the property or the equipment you are going to give it's not going to help this is the first factor you are going to do so so every very aware of this but once they come to the hospital routinely we will see patient daily or i will go to the post central town uh, they come to the hospital always they play a sick role i am not well today only surgery is gone i am not able to feed on the top of it that grandmother and grandfather they will also support Oh, no, 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 my uh, child is weak. Uh, now I can't give breast milk. You can give papa. It's, uh, it's a big myth. Uh, it's not a fact. Actually, uh, the breast milk, uh, breast milk is not related to only mental, uh, only physical. It is uh, related to mental. And the mother, uh, mother mentally prepared before the delivery or before the, before the labor pain started. Mentally prepared. Okay. After delivery, I will give immediately to breast milk to the kid. It will be the first vaccine. If they mentally prepared, it is very easy. Are the children in the post-operative period somewhere you know number two, or they will carry the how to do what to do so many problems are there. So whoever mother watching, whoever uh, grandmother watching the video, or for the family member, whoever get conceived, they are going to plan the pregnancy. They should mentally prepare. I am going to give my first vaccine to them. I give within half an hour. If the normal delivery is there as soon as possible, you can give the first thing. If it is LSCS, if it is cesarean. Within half an hour to one hour, and the car I come from the recovery room, we can start the breast feed because this is going to be a big gift for the children, and you can give up to six months breast feeding exclusively breast feeding, nothing else there. So up to six months, then you can continue breast feeding up to two years with other weaning food like other homemade food. We can give at least two years because why I am insisting at least two years now. So many mothers is working mother after six months they will abruptly stop the breast feeding and they will switch to the farmer feed or some home based diet. because the brain development is uh, children's brain development uh, will take up at least two years to completely uh, almost 95% of the brain development occurs in the initial phase so breast milk having lot of nutrition substances to to enlight the brain development to enhance the cognitive function so at least minimum of two years you have to supplement with the breast milk if it is possible otherwise if you are working mother you are working not able to you can express and keep it in the fridge whatever time the baby is there the uh, caregiver can give the breast milk so at least minimum of six months exclusively breastfeeding and at least 2 years you got to give up so i'm telling this uh, there are lot of benefits not only physical benefits as i told earlier uh, health is a physical and mental social well being like this kid uh, is playing well and uh, smiling well this baby is physically mentally and socially very strong he is looking his face i like that uh, for example if a baby crying at you know, night to o'clock uh, it is very difficult to feed the child if it if you are giving a form of feed the child will irritable with the Like try like anything. You have to switch on all the lights. You have to go to the kitchen. You have to prepare the milk. By the time uh, you have entered the family member will be second, the child won't stop the cry. When you start preparing the milk, when you putting in the uh, feeding bottle or the feeding vessel, by the time they enter the street, will be second. So socially also the breastfeed will have enormous benefit. If the child start cry, if you are breastfeeding the child, within a second you will switch off the cry. They, they start cry. Nobody knows the child is back up. They are breastfed or not. So it's not only the physical; it's, it's the breastfeeding. Also, the child mental stability. So the, the mother and uh, baby attachment will be very good to breastfeed. So breastfeed not only giving the physical strength, it's also giving the mental and social well-being. Also, it's giving. So breastfeeding is essential for any, for any baby in the world. So not only the baby; it also have lot of benefit for the mother. Also, so it's a lot of studies has proven it is reducing risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and It's prevent the postpartum depression and uh, type 2 diabetes, mental health, and it is the stress level, uh, large level. It's reduced the stress level. 
when you're stress free you can do anything well so it's not only help the baby it's helping the mother it is helping the family it is helping the community not only the initial phase now so many so many articles is coming down if you breastfeed the baby at least two years they are prone to die by the lifestyle uh, disease like obesity hypertension diabetes mellitus in the latter age group so if you give the first vaccine it's a, it's a gift to the baby nothing other than that so we move on to next hot topic this is the commonest topic among the uh, my baby is not fine and kolam the saapadra they cry my baby is not fine there is uh by going to this all issues you you can know only the human being is not, uh, only the human being is the fit to eat other all animals they will search for the food they will eat after the six, after the, the breastfeeding issues so all the animal they will even some animals you can see uh, the, the mother and uh, baby are also fighting for a single food only in the human age group we are uh, keep on feeding the baby that is a main issue so once is after 6 months you have to teach them how to feed them self feeding we have to start teaching by the age one year the child should be uh, uh, self feeding the child so you can ask it's very tough sir the child is uh, playing well it is so it's not at all it but we have to start uh, the the process when you when you sitting in the home and then the family you give small chat to the kid and uh, give small plate and that's it start feeding sir if the baby started self feeding the baby eat what they want what the practical difficulties what are most of them family members some my fear is see what we will fix on time fix 8 to 8:30 i have to feed the child 8 to 9 o'clock i have to wash the clothes 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock i have to watch this series 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock i have to take nap but still you know, know that you are trying to be sometimes you may be you can felt sometimes you 8 o'clock some sometimes you may hungry some days 8 o'clock you may become hungry 9 o'clock only you will get hungry like that we baby also and baby is not hungry when you are going to feed the child it is food hours not only come when whatever time you take the bowel the baby will run away ma'am taking the bread uh, food i want it so the the type of food hours in come so so you should note the hungry cues and the self feeding the child should know whenever i hungry i have to take the food. this is the second point uh, so many uh, other food uh, the, like biscuits and the junk food there are what is the problem with that they are more palatable they are more tasty but they have less nutritious and high calorie content so once they are used to that like uh, biscuits or cold drinks or some flavored food when you give a healthy food the baby will feel it is not tasty then they will start to so first point is you got to stop all this junk food and this uh, the tasty food non nutritious food if you stop it when hungry thing automatically the baby will uh, start feeding the nutritious food so it is simple as mom told you should always give colorful food like this vegetable what are the colorful food you should always avoid the colored foods so always give colorful food don't give any colored food so it should be always balanced food uh, if so it, it may it may uh, protein carbohydrate fruits vegetables and oil you have to give always balanced food and so many questions is that somebody uh, the one year kid how much food i have to give small it is like that Uh, uh, so many mothers will ask. The simple logic is at one year, if a male child is there, whatever the father eats, half the quantity the child eats. For example, if a father eats uh, two four idli in the morning breakfast, the child eats child should eat the same uh, idli, same chutney, two idli, half idli. So if he eats full bowl of rice, the child should eat half bowl. Of rice. No, no mixing, no, uh, no in the, in the mixi you uh, boil the food. No, no mixing. Nothing is needed. You have to give raw food like whatever you are. by the age of one year you should not prepare separate food from your home for the kid you have to give whatever food you are preparing in the family party got to have the baby you should feed the baby and feed the baby then only the baby will be nutritious and you should start like this some of some of the intelligent babies will eat like this some of the babies will do like this but meanwhile by by day by day by by training they will feed them such So never ever give bottle feed. It's a detrimental. They should have always uh, health related issues from starting the ear infection, stomach infection, uh, lung infection. They will have all type of issues. Don't ever give uh, bottle feed. It's normally affects. So another problem is that the lockdown area and the free internet connection is it's it's deteriorates the mental health of the baby like. 
10 years back uh, we had internet it is uh, it, it 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 is costly it's it's it is uh, it's worthy and uh, that that value is remembered by everybody you know on, on uh, 10 years back one gb data is very costly so you will go to the net may some of them uh, have gone to the breathing center for the half an hour you refer to the net and you pick up the important uh, information and you pay the money you take from now it is free when it is came free it's now become valueless so 24 into 7 the babies are keep on watching watching videos 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 games it's it's uh, definitely detrimental and due to the lockdown the babies keep on watching only so many mothers come sir without mobile my child can't be how is it possible you know, the mobile came and the internet connection came this free 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 broadband came uh, only the two to three years back before that there are errors of everybody uh, to the healthy food and they have you know, they are the examples so we should see the mother it is not the fact it's not the fact you can you can change or you can those tata party karang you can store it you can so moon everything is there story books is there but first take up the mobile from mother it is not only it's not only it's a it's a raising big mental health issue so so many children coming to with significant behavior problems significant speech delay significant learning disability because of the mobile and laptop first and foremost thing you have to do is wash the mobile with completely wash stop mobile screens it's very detrimental so say no to screens please especially so some somebody asks so sir how is this possible sir the online class is there how so many mobile apps is there it's yes there is a, there is a time limit for the average for example uh, the brain development occurs as i already told you uh, 95% of the brain development occurs in within 2 years so 0 to 2 years zero screen time whether it's mobile or tv or laptop or tab, uh, tab you should avoid except for if your distant relative is there father is uh, outside you can have video call for the five to start well otherwise no screen strictly no to this in the 2 to 5 years it's a advice full less than one or some some movies not during this feeding time not during this feeding time you can show that to monitor you should not give the mobile and you go to our work it's not possible just in youtube and so many so many things is comes students are not not aware of that so to monitor and the above six years you got to fit the limit and it's also money so less than two years no screen time because the brain development occurs no screen time for the less than two years so and how to care of the eyes because uh, now so many children to on- online classes so the rule is bigger the screen lower the strength so as much as possible if you want to do some educational video or education material use the biggest screen in your if you have smart tv you connect it to the smart tv you start doing it no smart tv it's not possible you can use the laptop if it is not possible it is tablet not at all for you have only mobile you can use the mobile but uh, the position also is very important it's not like that not like this not like this it's all wrong and it will definitely affect that uh, it will strain their back strain their neck it also affects their eyes so these positions are not at all advisable so there are the certain position if you watching tv it should be 10 feet distance from the screen and the screen and the, the eye level should be at the mid of the monitor if you watching a, a laptop or a computer it should be two feet away from the screen and the back the chair should be properly positioned so not at all possible if you want to watch from the mobile the angle of the head is exactly 30 30 30 degree it's not if you flex more like take it almost 27 kg of weight will be by the time you will grow old you will definitely have all type of cervical spondylitis bone related issues will help but children also for adult also ever if you have this uh, kids it uh, wise to use this stand for this mobile if you want to watch mobile large so uh, long time if you want to watch a video fix it stand for uh, sit quiet and watch <laughs> not in the hands of the so then one year one rule is that 2020 match like that one rule is rule is that uh, every 20 minutes take a break and uh, watch any focus object 20 feet Uh, distance for the 20 so these are the commonest topic i want to touch so some of the questions are there we will discuss in later so in summary uh, you should be breastfeed at least uh, two years okay. always give color food food not the color food keep self feeding for the baby and the less than two years there is not give any screens the bigger the screen always lesser the screen and 2020 20 20 like i told 
20 minutes to take a break. I'll focus the object on speed uh, and for the 20 seconds. So with this, uh, the health day, I want to mention the health value. What is the value of the health? We have a car, we have a lot of bank balance, we have a lot of professional name, everything. Everything is, is all zero in front of you. Health is like one. If you don't have health, Whatever you have money, whatever your bank balance, everything become absolute zero on the day. So always focus. Thank you so much for putting this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meghanathan. That was a really exhaustive presentation. Uh, we'll move on to our next panelist. Uh, geriatric care is a subject which is very often little talked about. And even though we all have our responsibilities and duties to our aged, towards our aged parents and elderly citizens. We are lucky to have on the panel Dr. Manika Saravanan S, an MD in Geriatric Medicine from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. He is currently attached to Kaveri Hospital in Chennai. A lifetime member of the Indian Academy of Geriatrics, Dr. Saravanan has been involved in a lot of research activities and conference presentations, and he has assessed a gamut of health issues that affect our elderly, such as frailty with aging, the gait and balance in old age, diminishing functionality, neurocognitive decline, and dementia, and also palliative care. May I request Dr. Saravanan now to give his brief presentation on the areas of specialization. Welcome, Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, ma'am. Thank you for the generous introduction. And I would like to thank my hospital and the Hindu for giving me this opportunity to share what we know a little about old age and old age healthcare and how to live happy and healthy in the old age. So with a brief introduction, I don't want to waste time. I want to proceed. So with that small introduction, I'm starting on. Just you can see on my slide that uh, small prayer. So they want with a perfect health. They want their sense organs, eyes, ears, tongue, and other organs to function properly. And they don't want to be helpless and dependent. This is not new. This is not my words. This is from my ancient prayer. Uh, prayer. So the problem is perennial and it is less exposed and there is le it is acknowledged very, very less. With that, uh, we go on. So by 2050, we will be having one in five people, that is 20% of the population will be more than 60 years of age and about 80% of them going to live in the low middle income countries, which is majority in the Asian countries. The population is going to double the old age population, which is in the 2000 and in the 50 years, the population is going to double. And all the old age persons are not the same. Some older people who have the uh, function of a 30 year old, some will having a function of a 90 year old. So that is what differentiates something between the super agers and the normal agers. And what cause we age? Why do we age? We have to uh, determine. There are, in the right side of the slide, you can see a lot of medical jargons. All this happens at the cellular level. So we cannot see it through the naked eye. All we seeing is we born as a child, we grow up as a child, or we be, get, become old. So what to, what can we do become uh, healthy uh, with the aging process and how uh, we can keep it up? It doesn't. Uh, restricted to our health or taking pills or taking health. It also depends upon the environment and how we age. It is the life course. So what happens with these processes? There are a uh, lot of ailments which occurs in the with the aging. You can see a lot of conditions uh, were happen happening. Uh, about in, If you age more than 65, about 80% of them having at least one chronic conditions and about 68% uh, of them having or two or more than chronic conditions uh, among these. Apart from that, uh, uh, there are specific problems which occur and very prevalent in the old age, which are acknowledged very less. They are uh, uh, recognized as being part of the old age and sometimes considered old age is a disease. Some of them are vision problems. Some of them are false. I am aged, so I am falling down. I, uh, because of age, I fall down. I'm aging, so I'm getting confused. I'm aging, so I'm losing muscle. I'm aging, so I'm getting nutrition. And one among them are urinary incontinence. They're leaking of urine. Due to embarrassment, people will share less with their, uh, this incidents with their family or friends or uh, not give much attention. 
and due to the common health conditions prevalent we call it as a geriatric syndromes because these coexist with the other health problems other chronic health problems like your high blood pressure high uh, sugars and high cholesterol arthritis and these constitute the two groups of population which requires a specialist care specialist old age uh, care for which the geriatricians who were trained upon one is uh, common problems with the known causes like your arthritis or uh, diabetes or bp problems along with unknown causes with the presence of geriatric syndromes so these populations need very specialist care and very special care so how to age very healthy and very happily so this should be the mantra eat well move well think well and connect well so eat well eat clean avoid processed food avoid packaged foods if you are obese there are uh, new clinical evidences and trials which constitute if you lose 5% of your body weight your diabetes there is high uh, sugars and high blood pressures can go into remission you can live without medicines for the rest of your life for this uh, chronic life conditions and regarding supplements there are b12 and there are vitamin d and some supplements might help if you are deficient and take with the help of doctors other than that i have seen people bombarded with one supplement or the other supplement for tiredness or one this and other others this constitute what call it as a polypharmacy if you are taking five or more medicines we call it as a polypharmacy this will result in your gas problem bloating of abdomen constipation and all things so eat well and eat clean and move well you just might be retired from your profession it doesn't mean you you uh, you have to rest for the rest, rest of your life you have to move actively exercise lift weights and keep exercising yourself you can you not to a power lifter at weight 100 kg you can lift a 1 kg or 2 kg of dumbbells or do some weights and we <laughs> prefer something called a resistance training to preserve your muscle mass you lose your muscles you become a weak and think well some of them might be having a childhood uh, dreams of becoming a artist painter or uh, something else just pursue that hobbies pursue a new hobby learn a new thing a language or even if you want to dance you can dance and pursue a hobby and focus on the uh, themselves so anyone uh, learning something new will keep their brain cells working and this can, this will lead to their brain aging uh, delayed and you, this might even uh, prevent you from developing the memory diseases like dementia and all connect well around 40 newer studies are saying around 40% of the older persons in the world feeling loneliness and loneliness is the prerequisite for depression dementia and all cause of the problems managing your uh, depressed older person is very difficult and uh, it is a problem the problem becomes the problem of the family so connect well connect with your friends and if you uh, are okay work well into old age work well in your 70s if work if your workplace is fine and you are finding happiness with your workplace and you can work well into 70s people who are work well in your 70s and are happy they are live longer in a healthier uh, happier and a healthier way have good friends among yourself love your family express your wishes to them Uh, may, uh, if you want some time alone let them know that i want your some time alone take time for yourself and uh, you can re- re- rediscover your uh, abilities to the fullest and live through it listen to your heart and body what it says and pursue that have your purpose in the life that uh, in the left side of the slide i have shown the ikigai meaning the purpose your reason for the being what is you are going to do every day decide that and uh, do that with purposefully rather than pursuing the goals uh, finding the purpose is leading to happiness this is not just a philosophy but gerontology which is a sister branch of the geriatric medicine which is equal to the psychology they found it whoever finding their purpose in their life they were less probable to develop any functional limitation they were less probable to develop dementia and they have decreased all cause mortality and they are emotionally well and they have higher satisfaction and have higher happiness so these are there are zones these are derived from there are zones called blue zones where the longest living people are living and their zones are uh, described as people forget to die about 
of the people are aged in that areas are more than 90 years and one in the three persons are uh, aged more than 100 years they are having higher happiness and higher satisfaction so what matters at the end that is uh, written by a, a nurse who call uh, cared for the dying people we call it as a palliative nurse Mrs. Brony, where she interviewed the people who are dying and their regrets, what they haven't done, what matters at the end. So these are the five commonest wishes they should have, they would have done. So first thing comes from they are not true to themselves, their dreams not fulfilled, and they have not had, they would have much more happier if they would have fulfilled it. And the second thing came from the most of the male uh, male people because they are the breadwinners of their family and they are breaking the poverty chain in their life. This mainly says because they miss the young uh, youngness of their children and they miss the uh, partner's companionship. So they wish that I wish I didn't had to work hard. I spend more time with my family. And that thing is like they have uh, to keep peace with others they didn't express. They were lived in the media care. They hadn't become what they can become as ones. The fourth thing is that due to the fastness in their life, they have stopped, uh, uh, lost touch with their friends and who gave their companionship or they could be the leaning shoulder. So they, they were not for them. What if my friend is for there uh, that I, am, I uh, could have felt better? And thus, people forget that happiness is a choice so they were lived inside the comfort of familiarity lived with emotions so with this arising problems the united nations has uh, declared this uh, decade as the decade of healthy aging what is the traditional life course that is you educate up to 20 maybe or 30 then you work and build your family then you retire that is the end of the life they are Proposing to change from the traditional course from the new map, there is a new way. There are new roles, opportunities are there. There are, when a older person is lost, it's like a lossness of the wisdom and a loss, a losing a library full of knowledge. So there are no avenues, there are new roles, there are new opportunities after your retirement. And education is a lifelong pursuit. Pursue something even after you retire, a new hobby or writing or whatever you want to fulfill when while you are younger. Sometimes if you work long, if provided you are what brings you happiness and you are comfort with the workplace, you can work long, maybe up to into the 70s or maybe into the 80s, have financial goals and attain financial freedom. The sciences, science is advanced in the uh, domain of aging, not only in terms of tablets, pills, but also are in the digitalization, but also to help in the rehabilitation. You can be independent, you can be free with the help of the assistive devices in the form of uh, motorized wheelchairs, call bells, alarm bells, and everything. And the physical health and the prevention of disease, we have a lot of vaccines coming up to for the vaccine preventable disease. Have a routine, regular health reviews and checkups with the specialist doctor for old age. Take care of your health. That is, which is not normal in the younger, also not normal in the old age. Old age is not a disease. Any, so, example falls or you are getting confusion, your memory loss, they are not normal in the old age. Old age is not a disease. So my takeaways will be, so old age is not about you are keeping your white hairs or your wrinkles at bay, but you are, it is always denotes happy, healthy, and aging in a very graceful, healthy manner. And uh, have good friends and do things brings you joy. While pursuing, pursuing this, there can be always challenges. So talk about these challenges with your friends or take it, uh, talk it to your professional health provider like a uh, psychiatrist or a geriatrician, how to convert these challenges into an opportunity to being happy and healthy. And take regular health checkups and health reviews with the specialist old doctor and old age or growing old is not about adding pills or uh, more medicines to you, but it is always adding about good health, which adds lives to the years. So with that, I conclude. Thank you for the patience listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saravanan, for giving us those inter interesting facts. 
All those who have joined us in this webinar, please do forward your queries as we are going to open our Q&A box. You may direct your questions to the specific doctor you wish to, and I would be happy to include as many uh, number of questions as possible. So in the meanwhile, let me start uh, this discussion with one basic question that often crosses the mind. Dr. Kavita, in a society like ours, you know, we normally go to a doctor only when we are ill. Now, only now there is a little bit of awareness. So would you uh, just briefly tell us, you know, at what age or from what age should we start getting an annual or a regular health checkup? I, I mean, you could cater, uh, categorize it into different age groups. I mean, uh, yeah. We do see uh, people getting into uh, health issues after a bit of uh, uh, 20, 25. Uh, because, uh, as I said, today's lifestyle has made us more sedentary. So once we leave college and we go to work, our life becomes more sedentary. So once uh, we enter into 25 years, I feel people become uh, complaining about aches and pains and obesity. And for women, if you see irregular menstrual cycles, polycystic ovarian diseases uh, prop up. And for men, of course, they do not have uh, uh, overall complaints like that, but they do have anxiety about whether do have, they have any cardiac diseases because they are sitting just like that. And more of uh, uh, internet gives them like uh, news is like young people getting cardiac diseases and uh, this overload of information. As Sir said, internet is always available for us and uh, certain uh, conditions are overread by people and they think that they can have cancers, they think they can have cardiac diseases. All this gives them more of health anxiety. So uh, partly we do a health checkup. We see people coming for health checkup only for reassurance, telling that they're all right. And partly it is done for their complaints. So I would generally say anybody who's having a, a lifestyle which is not very easy, and we see most of them working in the nights. So as I already told you, uh, these uh, neurotransmitters are very important to keep us happy. And, but unfortunately, most of the uh, computer science students have finished education and they're all working in the night. They come and tell, ma'am, we sleep only by early morning, four o'clock. They don't have sunlight exposure at all. So only if the sunlight falls on them, these neurotransmitters can uh, be produced. Only then they can feel happy. Most of the time they come to the clinics feeling that they are very stressed out. They are sleep deprived. And then that gives them anxiety. So, you know, as I told you, the science is already known to them that there, there, there is a depletion of all this, which is causing the anxiety. But it's not easy to convince them. So for those kinds of people, I, I recommend them to do a regular health checkup uh, about 25. And not that they need to do everything. See, basically, they, they can do their blood uh, uh, labs in the sense they uh, rule out anemia. So, you know, they can feel very fatigued if their nutrition is depleted. Iron deficiency anemia can be there. And, um, you know, uh, the lab values tell us to a certain extent how they are. So a basic primary health checkup with blood values and ultrasound would be sufficient for age groups below 30 if they are obese. Because obesity, again, causes problems like uh, you know, they can have gallstones, they can have a fatty liver, and these are all uh, conditions called as metabolic syndrome. There are candidates who will become diabetic in future. They are going to become hypertensives in future. If we give them counseling before so that they have a fatty liver, which is going, it's like a lazy liver, it's not going to use up your insulin, you can become a pre-diabetic. You can, your blood, sugar, blood pressure can be slightly on the higher side. We can do these health checkups and uh, screen them and give them advice, uh, both uh, dietary advice and lifestyle modification advices if they come for a regular health checkup. This is for below 30. About uh, 30 and uh, in the middle age group, 40 to 45, definitely they need a health checkup because they are in the midlife crisis. As um, Dr. Meghanathan and Dr. Manika Sadanen told, uh, midlife people are the ones who are taking care of their children as well as taking care of their uh, elderly people at home. So they somehow do not have the time to take care of themselves. So this puts them into a more amount of stress. So when they come, they can get themselves completely uh, screened. For women, uh, of course, they can have their annual pap smears. And they, above 40, we could recommend them to do a regular mammograms. Uh, and uh, above 50, they should have their uh, bone strength uh, analysis done with a DEXA scan. And uh, above 60, of course, uh, we would like them to definitely 
come around to do for a geriatric health checkups to see whether their memory is good, memory screen assessing is done, and whether they're osteoporotic, so that the risk of fall is not there, or whether they're, they're having osteoarthritis. And also, other than that, the regular uh, screening for mammogram is also done for women around 60 years. Uh, for both sexes, we definitely advise a general echo above 40. And definitely, if there is a uh, family history of any cardiac diseases, Okay, and of course, because as I told you, the lifestyle is so poor, the pandemic has given us, uh, a, COVID itself is a trigger for many uh, cardiac diseases. We, we like to screen them and uh, after examining them, we do of course ask them to do a routine uh, treadmill test if they are in a fit condition after the echo. So depending upon their age groups, I think they should come to a physician depending upon their uh, place and take the advice from the physician, what should be done for them. But generally, an annual health checkup is definitely required for everybody around about the 25 years of age. Oh, thank you. So I would request audience, we have opened that Q&A box. So please start uh, posting your questions. And meanwhile, Dr. Saravan, and you know, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that uh, uh, by learning new things, we can uh, delay brain aging. I think that's what you uh, said. So does it also mean that physically also you can remain young and keep looking young also? Definitely, 100%. A youthful mind is ne what is needed for a youthful skin and youthful appearance. Okay. So as we all understand, you know, there's a very important need to increase the production of our happy hormones, as Dr. Kavita has also reiterated in her presentation. And it helps to keep diseases at bay and obviously lead a healthy life. But to reach there, you know, it is always a struggle. It, it is not easy. I mean, it is the hard, I think the most difficult part is to get started on something. So Dr. Meghanathan, with our children, you know, who have been, or who generally say are normally a little less active. Some kids are hyper, some are interested into sports, some are lazy by nature. So, and add to it this two, two years of total sluggishness and staying at home. So how, I mean, could you tell the audience that, you know, how it is absolutely and why is it absolutely essential for our children to get back into shape, to remain into shape, both for short term and long term? Actually, this uh, COVID put the pass button in the world for the two years for the routine activities, especially in the children, especially in the their brain development age, especially in the children between age between two years to six years, they are mainly in the development age. They need social interaction, social everything. It's because of the COVID and lockdown, they have significantly affected. And second part, uh, part of the age group is around uh, uh, elder, elder children, like six years, seven years, eight years children. They go, they go, they go blocked in the room. They didn't go to anywhere. The problem is, the first problem arise was in the uh, lockdown period. They have skipped their daily routine. So basically, why we are going to send the school? It's not for only for land to maintain the daily routine, morning, 7 o'clock, you have to pack up, you have to get bath, you have to take food on time, you have to take, uh, take a break in the time, and you have to take lunch in the time, you know, sleeping hours too. To maintain the daily routine, that is a primary uh, aim of this, sending the children to school. So now the issue is, for the past two years, their, their daily routine is affected. You can remember, uh, when our old age school days, May month, only one month will be there. When the June first is coming, everybody will be just out. We can't go to school. Now, this two years of lockdown, now this past three months, we are having so many children with a stress issue, school issues. The two years labor, they are pouring, dumping, you have to take it. So, so, we have to focus on the children who are having stress. First of all, the parents should address whether the child is on stress or not. The first sign of stress is sleeplessness. The child won't have sleeplessness. Second point is they, will, they won't go to school. Then they will always, uh, they will uh, lock in the isolation. These are the signs, easy, easier signs of the stress you identify. You need not to label as a stressor, you need not to label as a mental issue. You sit with them, you discuss with them what is your issue, in a problem, in a, what you uh, what is a concern, you have to discuss with them. Then they will open up. We want to go to school, study well, go to school, study well, yelling is not going to help, it is going to deteriorate the problem. You want to sit with them, you discuss with them what is the exact problem. Then you advise. If you are not able to uh, give proper advice, then you can always uh, seek a health personal opinion. Then this is not the mental aspect. And physical aspect, uh, the, in Tamil Nadu, uh, power is a 
like that you should start a physical activity earlier daily you should you do exercise automatically your kids will start exercise no need to teach them if they will whatever you do they if you if you are mentally stable if you are in home and issue is there if you are approaching the issue in the stable way you are not angry the children will also be in the home in when they have stress they will also tackle in the same way this uh, health and all you can't teach the thing you have to you become a role model your parents and grandparents become a role model then it will automatically come and the entire family will be the healthy it's not only the children going to uh, health and the other other way around they will get not angry they will stress out they won't do proper exercise it is not possible to only focus on it right i get your point okay dr saravan and for a senior citizen we normally say 60 plus 70 plus 80 plus where would you put the finger first is it on the diet first or is it on a fitness routine first what tip would you offer them thank you thanks for the question it is not a one thing that uh, as, uh, this thing i have explained that are uh, multiple factors that what is do you can do with you how you can do with your surroundings the diet and all the things will help you to get better in terms of physical wellness that is losing life for example losing body weight will uh, keep your diabetes and your bp better likewise if you start the exercise there are some hormones uh, which will be secreted inside the body which will elevate your mood <clears throat> so it will decrease your stress also so if your stress is decreased your diabetes uh, get uh, will get into control your bp also will get into control so there is no one rule of thumb in geriatrics or in old age that only one thing going to make you better because the problems and the issues issues they are facing is multimodal and multifactorial and multifaceted so the approach should be also very multifaceted and multimodal approach to uh, include everything to address uh, achieve a common goal right so questions have started coming in they're mostly very personal and specific uh, dr kavita uh, mr ar shaker wants to know that maintaining body balance has been a challenge for him in winter he's getting feeling or getting too much cold and he says cooling allergy and in summer he's getting too much of body heat and he says i used to have a lot of hot food in winter so does it cause any issue in the body he is concerned thank you ma'am and of course uh, what is his age ma'am i am sorry he has not mentioned that he has not mentioned his age no. so losing balance is usually we see only in uh, when they age if he is around 60 years uh, balance issues come around that age and of course uh, balance issues can be due to many reasons it could be due to some vitamin deficiencies but he is telling more due to climatic changes Hmm. But uh, if he if he could just have a good assessment where there is a balance issue, you now is there a gait issue? Whether he's walking, his gait has become slow. But that is but that cannot be just uh, only in winters and only in summers. If it is a general issue, then it could he needs to be assessed. But his question is very vague. But uh, what I could say is depending upon the age, whether he has any deficiencies. Or whether he's having any other comorbidities, whether he's a diabetic, he's having uh, neuropathy, or is he having any other issues, it should be addressed. If it was a little clear, I would have been able to explain more more about it. Uh, Doctor Saran, and do you think these balance issues can come in a younger age group also, uh, like around? Um, Ma'am, get a question here. Do you think you could give a good insight? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm not sure about the younger age, but I can. Uh, as the old, I think anything younger yeah. there, balance yeah. are uh, these things are not normal. There are uh, only uh, there are uh, multitude of causes for that. Right from the well, there are arthritis, there are nutritional problems, there may be something called neuropathies. There are some reversible conditions, brain conditions could lead to that, or there may be a cognitive impairment, as you say, uh, how they process their walking and everything. So, so ma'am. Happy if he needs his uh, medical conditions and his age to give him a more clarity uh, feeling. Right. If he writes again, I'll let you know. Uh, Dr. Sarvanan, uh, Ms. Sri Vidya wants to know how can we reverse cognitive decline in the elderly? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question. It's an interesting question. How can we reverse cognitive decline? First, uh, we have to identify what is the baseline, then, what, is the, what are the causes for cognitive decline? There are plenty of causes which there are reversible and non-reversible causes. One of the reversible causes are like depression. There are 
some nutritional deficiencies can cause uh, present as cognitive decline also then we go we ruling out then we have to assess the person's cognition uh, how much decline and this thing there are some medicines to uh, delay the irreversible causes that we call it as dementia so we have to rule out it is dementia or non dementing cognitive decline and uh, to rule out the reversible causes we if there are find any reversible causes we have to uh, start treatment for uh, reversing it if not uh, if, uh, cognitive decline cannot be reversible for uh, example it's if a variety of dementia there are medicines to delay the cognitive decline right one more quick geriatric question from mr ashok kumar whose mother is 80 year 80 years old has less body weight high bp and swelling of feet for one month last one month so okay. what is what should be his reasons of worry okay ma'am thank you thanks for the question he noted uh, there is a high bp also and yeah. he has mentioned that she is yeah thank you uh, she yeah. was patient uh, denoted whether he has uh, other uh, what are other there are any comorbidities and these things and uh, there are any nutritional status we have to assess but considering the high bp and the uh, low uh, uh, leg swelling by both legs i would uh, like him to consider a doctor to rule out any uh, heart diseases or any kidney diseases affecting uh, affecting it due to the elevated bp how much is elevated he didn't know he mentioned high bp what is high what is the numbers we don't know but i would recommend uh, since he is mentioned high bp with the bowel swelling at both legs i would request him to consider uh, a specialist doctor mm -hmm. okay uh, dr kavita uh, karan pradhan wants to know how the circadian rhythm affects an individual's health with uh, this person has shifted from northeast to south india and is having some problems and he like he's looking for for a solution okay so the circadian rhythm is actually how the the neurotransmitters and the hormones have their own base where they get secreted so a good sleep pattern is very important for all this ma'am especially the endocrine hormone thyroid hormone follows a circadian rhythm so generally if there is no good the lifestyle is not good they do not have sleep pattern properly they do not have good sunlight exposure all this can affect their circadian rhythm but just within a same country i don't think it's going to matter it matters individual to individual whichever country you are in the circadian rhythm is not going to change like that it's only your lifestyle if you have the correct lifestyle if you are having the correct uh, dietary uh, resources and uh, uh, sunlight exposure and exercise pattern the, the rhythm is not going to change it's not because you come from north india to south india it's not going to change uh, or is going to move from india to america it's not going to change it's just generally you need to follow your own uh, self discipline right so many times when people are on the travel you know they have gone to a new place they are eating new kind of food they are also not perhaps able to digest it or they are not even able to have food on time because of their work schedules and things like that so uh, and then they maybe they end up also taking antacids on their own without going to a doctor so is it right to do because is is that the reason why they have this acidity problem and is it right for them to do so okay ma'am so uh, talking about acidity so uh, our stomach produces uh, when you feel hungry the stomach already the brain senses that we are hungry and it sends impulse to the stomach so already the stomach knows that the food is going to come at this particular time once you feel hungry the bell rings okay and then immediately we have certain uh, uh, substances in the stomach which comes out especially hydrochloric acid for digestion so probably at 12 o'clock you are feeling hungry or are looking at a photo of a burger or a dosa or something your mouth waters that instant itself the brain uh, knows that this person is hungry and it produces this hydrochloric acid but unfortunately at that particular time if you're not going to eat okay when you don't follow a pattern of eating your stomach would have actually produced the hydrochloric acid but you would have not eaten so this a constant repetitive a missing of food starvation can lead to certain symptoms like burping that that means the hydrochloric acid you know our mucous membranes are made out of very fine uh, cells 
So yeah. these cells can be slowly being eaten up by the hydrochloric acid, where we say that is only gastritis. So probably we would, it might not even be gastritis, but it can uh, full blown gastritis is totally different. But you can have certain symptoms like burping, epigastric pain, and you know you feel so hungry, and sometimes you feel like nauseating. These are all symptoms when patients say, uh, "Doctor, I feel like this." At that particular time, we do give antacids to relieve their symptoms. But saying so, it is not advised to take these antacids or these medications without a proper uh, physician um, uh, prescription, and also not recommended taken on a regular basis for a long time. Right. So one for both the pediatrician and the geriatrician, you know, like people say old age is our second childhood and both the stages perhaps present some similar set of problems, the, the lack of sleep or not being not eating enough or either losing weight, not gaining weight enough. So, uh, Dr. Meghanathan, if you would first take it like, you know, if your child is a fussy eater, if your child is a cranky sleeper, what exactly, you know, would you tell the parents or how exactly would you like to change the routine of a child? I mean, of course, I think the age, again, the age group will matter, yeah. but broadly, you know, how will you uh, treat uh, this child? So, uh, this is the commonest issue in our parents' mind. Yeah. Well, it's not uh, eating, not gaining weight. This yeah. First, uh, you should know uh, exactly what is happening. Yeah. For example, whether it is true or not, first we go to weight check. Whether the child is uh, weight is adequate for this age or not, first we go to weight check. So roughly, I will tell. Uh, for example, uh, if a kid, if a child born on three kg, the birth weight will be doubled by five to six months average. By five months, the child will be six kg. By one year, the birth weight will be tripled. So like if the child, uh, when the newborn born on three kg, the by one year of age, the child will have uh, nine kg. And for one year to say two years, by one year, they will gain only three kg. So by two years, they will have full kg. So, so many uh, issues occurs in the one year to two years. Because in the, for the first year, the child will have, the child will look quite very chubby and the gain weight will be, them. they will come to the routine health checkup. So the first month will be three kg, second month will be four kg, by five months will be six kg, by one year will be nine kg. But next year, they come to the follow up, the weight gain will be slow down. It's, it's actually the growth pattern. So first you have to understand this is a growth pattern, but right? whether it's, it's correct or not. When, the, when a two year kid having only eight kg, nine kg, then we have to intervene. This is the first point, whether it's correct or not. For about three, uh, two years, three years, every year they will hardly will take only two kg to three kg per year. Then we have to always uh, plot a height and weight in the growth chart. With age specific and uh, gender specific growth chart is there, you have to chart the height and weight in the growth chart and identify whether it is correct or not. Whether the growth pattern is correct, then only we can go to the other part. When, when the growth is correct, the child is good, no problem, no need to worry at all. It's, uh, the central is good, no problem. When the child is not gaining weight properly or not gaining, uh, getting the uh, height properly, when you have to look for the cost. First cost is the most, foremost cost is the nutritional cost in our India. Anywhere you go, the malnutrition is the first cost. There are the rare cause of all the diseases that they will leave. The nutritional cost. The nutrition is the first eater. So, that I absolutely told. Uh, you always uh, uh, teach the style when you are hungry, you go to take food. You, you should not teach when I am taking the food, you should eat. That's the first problem. Most of the mother having this 8.30, 9 o'clock, I have to feed the child that to three piece. It's not possible. How the child will know that the, it may not be the hungry. The child you know, may not, that food is not uh, palatable. The, child, the taste will not be good for the child because also some of them will like chicken biryani, some of them like mutton biryani, some of them will not like Brian at all. The children also have their own taste pattern. You can't force them to see. So you should identify that. That's why I'm telling always you offer food in the plate, it's taking from your home, uh, home part. You give all offer. Let the uh, uh, people eat them. Then observe what are the eating pattern, what food he is eating more, what food he is eating according to you offer. You have to change the cycle. And second part of the cycle is you should not give any flavored things are tasty food, junk food. If you give those things, the child, uh, the child automatically have good taste, but less nutrition, high caloric, it will reduce the appetite. Automatically, the child will uh, go for that biscuit. If the child, if you give you some uh, flavored biscuit, and uh, on the same day, if you give some nutritious food, rice or uh, anything like that, the child automatically wants it. The craving is always good. So stop the junk foods, uh, give the give variety of food, Ask them to self-feed during the hunger. It automatically solves the most of the issues. 
So lesser age groups, some they have some kind of malathasar syndrome. They have some disease pattern that after ruling out all this, this, this pediatrician, we will case by case we will go. But certainly we will give couple. Right, Doctor Saran, would you like to take it forward for the sleep concerns in the elderly and how it has an impact on their health? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, I would like to address this in the sleep problems into two two parts. One is the associated with the medical illnesses and not not associated with the medical illnesses. One of the patterns in the sleep is five to seven hours of uninterrupted sleep is enough. What many of the older people are doing is like uh, tend to do is like they not physically active, they not tend to pursue, so they sleep all the day. So they will uh, go to the doctors and they will say I'm not sleeping at the night. Sometimes they will give the uh, sleeping pills and it will cause dependence at some times. There are certain medicines. So what I said, do you sleep at the daytime? So majority, yes, I do sleep at the daytime. If you are sleeping at the daytime, you are not going to sleep. Get sleep at the night. So be active in the daytime. Spend in that hobbies and something you want to do. Someone who want to meet, go out, meet and do something. So don't sleep in the uh, daytime. If you are at all not available, you can limit it to 30 minutes or one hour because everyone likes the post meal nap <laughs> and it is always in use. So you can keep it to 30 minutes or one hour. Then coming to the medical part, what interrupts it to uh, your sleep? Sometimes it can be medicines, some medicines which cause urination at the night, some of the medicines which cause uh, uh, increased heart rate at the night. Sometimes uh, there are some medical issues like enlarged prostate. Uh, which causes uh, uh, tend to the people tend to pass urine at the night, which we call it as nocturia, or some urinary tract infections might happen, which will not present in the old age with fever or uh, anything else. It will very present in a typical manner. They will tend to pass more urine. And if coming to the non-medical part, what causing your sleepness? Are you stressed? Are you feel alone? Are you depressed? So how you feel? that should be addressed after rule out all these things if you are not getting a six seven hours sleep at night then you can prescribe ask their lifestyle habits what they are doing with the in the era of digitization the for a lone older adult the mobile was more friend or companion than any other people so they did uh, mobile watching uh, even late into the nights hearing songs or whatever to like so i used to say that Keep your mobile up to us before bedtime. Schedule your bedtime every day routine. Go to sleep, go to the bed every day. If you are going to sleep at 10, go to sleep at 10. Make it a routine habit. Keep your mobile at 8 p.m. Don't watch your mobile after 8 unless it is necessary. Read something or some books or newspapers or some uh, prim, uh, novels or some something you read. And just try to close your eyes, just lie down. Uh, this is the way they have to develop a yeah, sleep protein, which is called as a sleep hygiene. So, uh, yeah. Dr. Uh, Seven, is it correct? Because, you know, if you, if you look at patients who are really old, say who are 80 years, 90 years, who may, who may be having a lot of comorbidities and who are not able to follow what you're saying, read a book, who are not interested in listening to music. So is it is it okay for them, say in, in that 24 hours in a day, they can sleep just five or six hours, whether they are cat naps divided over the day, or, or, or you're saying that they no, they have to sleep only during the night. Can even like these special cases, uh, can they divide their sleep and have that total five or six hours spread through the day? Is that okay? No, they have to. Yeah, there is a circadian rhythm. If you meddle with that, there will be stress going that to is, increase, and uh, right. even you are going to meddle with the hormones inside the brain, which brings you more stress. Okay. So you can't uh, restrict the cat nap to 30 minutes or one hour or so. You should, it will be better if they are having uninterrupted sleep of uh, around six to seven hours, that is enough. Right. So again, for the pediatrician and the geriatrician, you know, like uh, say the, uh, how to detect uh, autism or the early onset of dementia in the aged, you know, for both the age groups, I mean, how to detect it early or how to first maybe you can continue dr servant quickly and then dr yeah. can add thanks the onset that. of dementia how to yeah. yeah dementia is a very umbrella term not restricted to memory there are something is normal part of aging like you forget placed your glasses somewhere keys somewhere you are able to recall it after remembering maybe 10 seconds or 15 seconds this is very very normal dementia is a very umbrella term not restricted to memory itself 
so if any persons having say living in the same locality carrying out their daily activities like if he is advocate uh, he is a business person he forgot the meeting fixed in the he fixed in the day which is become very routine and if he is a financial analyst or a, someone handling the money they have difficulty in handling the money or uh, difficulty in with the calculation if they are wandering in the night without knowing uh, where they are or if they are having behavioral problems which is not usual with them like urinating in the public or they are very aggressive uh, with the uh, relatives are using sometimes using inappropriate words uh, like this all this all can denote early onset of dementia one more is in a familiar neighborhood you are living in with the uh, same area for uh, 10 years or 5 years you know your way to a temple or church now you are not able to go to uh, temple or church you are feeling you are losing your way you are not able to find the way to return home that should be alarming so if any person having this any of two or three more symptoms that could be the earlier sign of dementia Right. Dr. Meganathan, likewise yeah. for autism. Now, now, this mobile era, this autism is upcoming, the data is also in common, it's affected by autism. So, uh, first and foremost thing is, in autism, the concept is there. One is uh, response to verbal uh, name, name calling response. When your child, when you are calling the name, when they are not responding, they are in their own, you should respect the person. Second point is the vocalization. When the baby, when the, by the age of one year, they say the child should be able to spell amma, appa, father, um, mommy, daddy, like that. By the age of two, the child should say two word sentences. Mommy, come. Father, go. I want. You go. Like that, two word mingle sentences should be said. Then if you call, if you speak, there should be some eye-to-eye -eye contact. When you, when you look at the baby, the baby look, uh, should look at you and you should be, eye-to-eye uh, -eye contact should be there. So no eye, -eye contact, no uh, name-calling response, no vocalization, no two word sentence. You should always suspect. You should not label. Because this, this, this Due to this lockdown, I have an enormous patient, an enormous patient presenting with a significant language delay, no contact, no behavior from it. It's all due to this lockdown related issues and the mobile war addiction. They, if you put up a M chart for this baby, they will, uh, they will uh, have like a full floor reduction. But it's not in the case. If you, if you stop the mobile phone and you give them the liberal source of interaction and language rehabilitation, so many children come out of that. It's, it's not like labeled as something. So, so I, I, in this post-lockdown era, my humble advice, don't name any babies as a autism at the initial point. If you have fluoride symptoms, it's a classical symptom, it's there, then only after one week, two week assessment, we can label as a autism. So these are the three periods, no, uh, no uh, response to name, no eye contact, no language, then you should always have consult your pediatrician. He will assess by M chart and he will have speech assessment and occupational therapy assessment and clinical psychology assessment. By the complete assessment, one day we can label as a case. So many mothers will come and tell me, sir, my child is having autism, give some medication. It is not a fact. No investigation, no treatment, no medicine is there. So only this is a clinical based diagnosis and the therapy is the only proven management for that. So as much as earlier you come, the better the, better the uh, prognosis. Okay, thank you. Dr. Kavita, if somebody is on a BP treatment or thyroid medication, is it true that there is absolutely no escape from this lifelong treatment? There is no other alternative once you have started these medicines? Uh, yes, ma'am, because if they have been clinically evaluated and been on the medicine for a long time, generally we do not stop the medication unless and otherwise they are having other symptoms, like if they have thyroid symptoms and they've been taking for a long time. And in case drug-induced hyperthyroid status they become, that's when we taper the dosage. Or in case they're having BP and they've been on a long-term medication for blood pressure, which means that they have been evaluated and given for a long period of time, then there is no necessity for us to bring down the medication unless and otherwise these medications are giving some other effects. So other than that, they, nobody should be able to taper on their own medications or stop these medications because there is always a chance of accelerated hypertension. You know, when you stop the medicine, they might think they're okay for two to three weeks, but suddenly out of the blue, the blood pressure can suddenly rise up. So it's always better. They do not uh, meddle with their medications without any physician's help. Right. So I've been indicated the time is up, but I'll take one very light question. Somebody wants to know when you have terrible mood swings, how do you fight your, you know, internal, he's saying internal laziness? 
for okay. both physical and mental health whoever wants to answer whoever uh, any of you can also I give both the now seen from children to elderly with middle age ma'am these mood swings are very very common and of course pre uh, pre menstrual mood swings are more common for women uh, again what i would like to touch upon is uh, as we see as a family children are at this particular generation have a lot of peer pressure as sir said the internet use has become so vast so children have peer pressure uh, women and men uh, uh, in the middle age have their own pressures of financial stress and post covid uh, health reasons and other things have also made their uh, moods become very ir- irritated irritable and elderly people staying alone at home loneliness and has also provoked mood swings so the mood swings is not actually pertain to one particular age as of now or any particular uh, disease as of now it's only that you have to take it forward as i told you uh, everybody has to go into a uh, zone of good lifestyle where we can uh, make sure that we can produce our own happy hormones see mood swings will be there because of various reasons it could be financial health reasons children's peer pressure and uh, old age uh, children are abroad and they are not uh, seen their children for a long time fear of death fear of fall anything can provoke them to get a, a irritable mood but probably we we need to understand that it's global right now everybody is having this issues post pandemic it can be globally addressed by only uh, i feel it is more with a lifestyle modification um, more amount of exercise and uh, healthy habits we can come over it and of course they can come to a physician or a psych- uh, psychiatrist and see whether they need any intervention for their mood disorders or any other ailment is causing it right but uh, i i i i'll ask them also to say their uh, views does anybody want to add uh, briefly because we have to wind up uh, only on to sarvanan actually uh, basically i already told uh, health is a physical mental and social well being what now we are focusing on social well being i want to and i want to uh, want to this on the loss of our physical health and mental issues mental so you always in the morning you start doing your daily routine you should first focus on your physical fitness you do at least 24 hours in a day 24 minutes you should have alert for the physical you do some physical exercise probably i advise some uh, in a, in a inner exercise so in house exercise indoor exercise it is easy to follow and it is easy to continue and the longer it is is there persistent if you go gym if you go walk it, it, it is not possible in other days so focus on your physical activity in the first 24 minutes and the 5 minutes of breathing or meditation to focus on your mental stability then you start your day and in the job everything then your social life these are the your social life what we are doing is opposite vice versa we always in the morning itself that meeting that meeting your group or that we are focusing for our social life on the loss of our physical and mental so always in the morning like you without brushing you can't come to your duty like you know sick like stress you should not go to your duty then it's your more power so if you it's very easy if you are focusing on 24 minutes a day it is very simple you can easily follow the thing is you have to wake up some 24 minutes before Right. Dr. Saravanan? Yeah, thank you. So the okay. common cause of mood swings in the older adults are happening because it is due to the lack of communication. Because there is a, a generational difference or the expectations where it is not meeting like after retirement or going, growing old, the children expect they are, they are going for exercise or running. So I'm going for 4 a.m. running. We are not coming. So, so it is like uh lack of communications and the, due to the expectations and goals set uh, between the generation they have their own uh, problems and they are they have their own uh, day to day activities when their crosses over or mingles over the mood swings can happen so it's just a matter of sit and talk between the caregiver and the older adult in rare rare stuff sequences can take the help of the professional help either in the form of a geriatrician or a psychiatrist might help and the therapy right so thank you so much doctors for sparing your time on a busy weekday and sharing with your with our audience your valuable inputs on how to lead a healthy and a happy life i'm sure all those who tuned in today have also some valuable takeaways and they would have clearly understood what uh, dr saravanan mentioned in his uh, presentation on ikigai the reason for being so i thank the audience for joining this webinar uh, the hindu wellness webinar which was presented by kaveri hospital thank you so much thank you very much
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.